Today's topic is the secrets to managing subscription billing challenges. We have two great speakers today. We have Kyle Christensen, who's the Senior Director of Product Marketing here at Zora. He's a subscription billing expert. And we also are very fortunate to have Dean Carlson on the phone, who is the CEO of UPath. UPath has an online project management solution. Great. Thanks, Grover. And thanks, everybody, on the line for joining us today. We've got a bunch of great content lined up. But more importantly, we have a uh, really fortunate to have with us an incredible customer of ours, uh, Dean Carlson, CEO and founder of ViewPath. ViewPath has been with us uh, since the early days at Zora, and so um, you know, Dean knows Zora inside and out, and uh, they have an incredible solution as well. They do SaaS collaboration and project management. So, and it's funny, we actually used ViewPath to help plan for this, this webinar. So, Dean, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much. For those of you who are not familiar with UPath, we are a leading provider of online project management solutions. Uh, prior to founding UPath in 2002, I spent a lot of years as a project management advisor to public and private sector organizations. During that time, I was frequently exposed to the many headaches of installing and maintaining software uh, across dispersed project teams. So the very first version of UPath, which we launched eight years ago, was driven by the strong belief that organizations of all sizes would eventually, operative word eventually, replace <laughs> installed project software with online application models. Uh, fast forward today, in addition to our standalone product additions, we give customers integration options with popular apps such as Salesforce and Google Apps. Uh, we consider that a big part of keeping our business economically scalable is providing self-service subscription plans to the thousands of organizations that now use ViewPath. So uh, Zora is a cornerstone of keeping us economically scalable, in my opinion. So that's a high-level overview. Uh, that's who we are. Great, great. Thanks, Dean. And you know, we, we see a lot of uh, visionaries like, like yourselves in our customer base. That's folks who are really embracing the cloud, embracing software as a service, and embracing the subscription economy to help drive their businesses. Uh, and so, you know, subscription economy is, is something that, that we, we believe is, is kind of happening now at the highest level uh, out there in the marketplace today. So, so what is that? What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that rather than purchasing uh, big pieces of infrastructure uh, in technology, like rather than paying Oracle millions of dollars for an Exadata box, people would rather just consume services uh, as, as a subscription over the Internet and buy them from companies like ViewPath or Google Apps or Salesforce.com. And so technology, as usual, that industry is, is one of the first to adopt subscription services, but we see it moving more and more into even the services we use every day as consumers. Zipcar, I think, is a fantastic example. Why would you want to pay GM $20,000 for a vehicle that you're stuck with for five or ten years when you can just pay for a service for Zipcar where you can rent a grocery dealer during the week and then trade that in for an SUV to go up skiing on the weekend? Uh, we see it in media as well. People don't really buy CDs anymore when you can subscribe to services like Pandora or Rhapsody and get any artist you want on demand anytime you want to. And obviously, uh, you know, I don't know any of my friends who, who purchase DVDs anymore. Everyone really subscribes to services like Netflix. Whether they get that service delivered digitally or via DVDs in the mail, it's just an incredibly valuable service. And so subscriptions are not just valuable for consumers, but they're fantastic for businesses as well. And why is that? Well, it's because you can monetize your relationship with customers over a lifetime. You know, in the traditional world of shipping goods and services and what we call the transaction economy, every sale you made was a new battle you had to fight. And you had to knock down that customer's door, go through a sales cycle, sell them a product, and once you were done, you had to do it all over again to capture the next sale. Subscriptions, very, very different. Once you lock that customer in with perhaps a free trial or a low-cost option, you have the opportunity over time to slowly drive more and more revenue from that existing customer. So you drive them to maybe a paid subscription, and maybe you layer on a new add-in service, and a new premium service, and you get them to renew, and more and more of that revenue comes out of that existing customer base. And that's why you see folks like ZDNet talk about uh, the concept that the future for business is not really the purchase of goods and services, but it's a price provided to a customer for an ongoing relationship with that customer. And you see those existing relationships are the things that are really driving company growth. And the data backs that up. So I just took a quick snapshot. I picked one industry, which is technology. And just look at the valuations and the multiples that real SaaS businesses are being valued at. 
Salesforce, NetSuite, Concur being some prime examples, 9 to 12x revenues as opposed to folks who are great at shipping boxes, and this is not a knock against these companies, but um, you know, Hewlett Packard, HP, SAP, you have 3 to 5x revenues, and it just shows you that the difference in the, in the valuation of subscription as opposed to shipping boxes one after the other. So how does this work? Well, think about a brand new business. The first year you're in business, all your revenue comes from your new customers. Move to year two, you get to layer on any new customers you acquire on top of revenue you're getting from existing customers. You play that out over time, year three, year four, year five, and it's not unusual to see 70 to 80 percent of your revenues uh, coming from your existing install base. So, Dean, I, I know this is, this is likely true for you guys, being that you are a, a SaaS business. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of existing customers to, to your business? Oh, indeed. Uh, so I'm reflecting on the slide you just had previous to this to show this cycle of the freemium to premium model. So ViewPath uh, uses that pretty well to the letter. We uh, start people off with a uh, light free version. We provide a free trial upgrade to our standard edition, which is more or less the paid premium. Uh, during that time, people have 15 days to make up their minds. They can then either upgrade or downgrade. Uh, those people upgrade, then we have add-on services we provide. We even have further advanced features that we provide and layer on. So there is this uh, uh, very kind of comprehensive subscription uh, interactions that go on from the start of a new customer to the, a mature customer. And that's where we want to have a fully automated uh, subscription plans that uh, are, are self-service for the users because we don't uh, you know, feel that it's, that it's important that we support that with people on the phone. Yeah, and, and we see that a lot, uh, you know, whether it's whether it's a technology company or, or maybe business uh, consumer oriented service, you know, that we see the same pattern repeat itself across industry. Yeah. Uh, I, I think some of the challenges that people face, though, is that a lot of the tools that they have been using just weren't equipped for this concept of a subscription that changes and evolves over time. So if you think about a traditional transaction oriented model and traditional enterprise software, um, they're really all built around the concept of an order. So you have your, your physical products, you then translate those into SKUs that show up on opportunity objects in a CRM system. As the deal progresses, that translates over to a SKU that is reflected on a quote, on an order and on an invoice. And all in all, that entire process is one encapsulated standalone transaction. And, and that's all it is. But as we just talked about, subscriptions are very different. Subscriptions are constantly evolving and changing over time as you're adding new services and layering on new add-ons for your existing install base. And so the fact that people have been tied to these traditional transaction-oriented applications result in a few challenges that we see our customers having to overcome. The, the first challenge is what we call product challenge. And it's this idea that subscription products are inherently a little bit more complex than traditional physical goods and services. Uh, there's more dimensions to them. So you think about a, a traditional you know, physical product, you can have different attributes. You can have a blue one with a 17-inch screen and a certain amount of RAM and processing power. But all those attributes just translate to a single one-time charge for a single SKU. Contrast that with a subscription plan. Subscription plans can have one-time charges, like setup fees. They can have recurring charges that go along with it. And those recurring charges can be broken out by days or weeks or months or quarters or years. And then on top of recurring charges, you can start to layer in things like tiers and overages and charges that you pay up front and some in arrears. And so you, you try to shove all those dimensions of subscription products into traditional systems, and they just don't fit because they weren't designed to do anything more than just say one price point for one product and one SKU. And so what we see is our customers um, get more and more sophisticated with their products as they grow and as they mature. And oftentimes it's, it's customers who are driving this change and it's also competitive forces that are driving this change. So we see a typical life cycle that people go through where they'll launch their business and they might have a single product and it starts out pretty simple. You have simple monthly recurring price for that one single product that you go out the door with. From there you start to think about, well, how do I maybe enhance my revenue? Uh, rather than getting people to pay monthly, maybe I want to lock in some revenue up front and, uh, and, and sell a year's worth of subscription or a multi-year contract. So that introduces a new dimension. 
From there, you hopefully have some success, and you go and you expand your product line. So now you have not just product A, but you have product B, and it's uh, it's complementary to the first product. And of course, you then invent different product bundles to go with it. And then from there, you think about okay, how do we now optimize the pricing? So maybe we have different pricing tiers across all our product bundles, and you charge a lower price for a higher volume. Um, you know, maybe you experiment with different usage scenarios. Usage can be anything from how much memory that person's consuming, how much processing power, uh, how many emails get sent out of the system. Really, there's no limit to the things you can meter and charge usage fees for. And then we have other customers who are getting really scientific and do, actually doing A-B testing to figure out which packages and pricing is, is most attractive to consumers to, to get them to upgrade their, their products. And then finally, if you're really successful, you start to think about international growth. And you start to think about, well, should we release different pricing packages for different countries or even different regions within countries. And then there's all the crazy currency and taxation issues that go along with that. So Dean, I know you touched on some of these strategies that you guys do. Um, can you talk a little bit more about maybe the different dimensions that you see in the products that you guys offer? Well, it is interesting, the evolution of our subscription model. So uh, years ago, we started off with a very simple kind of product lineup. Uh, but then due to customer demand, we provided integration services with Google Apps. So uh, many customers today uh, sign up through the Google App Marketplace. We've got other customers uh, that are signing up through the Salesforce App Exchange. Uh, we have also other distribution channels. So we've uh, evolved our product to now layer in and the provision for these other marketplaces. So on any given day, we have hundreds of signups, and we need to track uh, where what's the source of that lead, uh, and then uh, understanding are they domestic or they're international. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, international growth. We're just now starting to experiment uh, or touch upon that as our customers overseas are kind of demanding uh, an easy uh, self-service subscription model. Yeah, that's that's great. So it, it's what you start to see is. Complexity starts to come with success. Right? The more customers yes. you take on, the more services you roll out, the more markets you expand into, you start to layer on more and more complexity. That's right. And so what happens is this phenomenon that we call skew explosion. Uh, just to give you one example of this, one of our customers, this company Jimdo, who does a web, uh, basically on a website online without any infrastructure, they were on our, our webinar last month. Um, in their minds, they have a pretty straightforward product offering. They have about five different products, and within those products you can subscribe with three different subscription terms. Uh, they have you know, about five add-ons you can throw into the mix, and they're a, uh, a European-based company, so they sell to a bunch of different countries at 15 currencies. And never mind, that's, that's not very complex. These are all just dimensions of their product. But what they try to do is, is shove all that into a system designed for single physical goods, and you, you multiply those out, and they ended up with over 1,100 SKUs they had to manage in their product catalog before they moved over to Zora. So you can see how this, that complexity just becomes a burden and a drag on your business. So the second challenge that, that we see people run into is this, this concept that subscriptions are not a one-time event. Subscriptions last uh, forever for the life of the customer, and they're constantly changing over time. So you go through this process where you have the initial sales process. You might use something like salesforce.com to support that. A lot of our customers, about 75% are using sales initial sale. But then once you make that sale with a subscription, you've got the initial order. You've got to go through an add-on as you release new products. People upgrade and downgrade their service. Uh, people will change the frequency at which they want to pay. They might lock themselves into a three-year plan, or they might switch back to a monthly plan. They've got a variable usage, and of course, you've got this concept of renewal. And all these things are affecting the same subscription before you flip it over to the accounting system to, uh, to track things in the GL and to, to fulfill the order. And so the, the challenge comes, uh, number one, with what we call the mess of multiple invoice problem. And so think about a traditional system. Traditional systems designed for one-time orders that don't change. So a customer signs up. You've got an initial order. A great ex example we heard from one of our customers, just to create a three-year subscription contract for a customer, they had to create 36 different orders in their application because they had to divide it up and do 36 separate monthly orders for one simple three-year subscription. Kind of a nightmare. Um, what we're seeing more is that you know, some solutions offer you the ability to take that one order and divide it up in monthly invoices that go out. And, and that's okay. Uh, and that works okay for the initial order. 
But what happens when you upgrade or make a change? That's when things start to fall apart. You go to upgrade, you have to create a second order. And that order has its own set of invoice schedules that go along with it. So just adding more users in the middle of a contract, and all of a sudden you go from 36 different orders to 72 different orders. And then what happens when customers upgrade to a new service that you just rolled out? Yet another order and another set of invoices that need to go out. And so now you've got a situation where, uh, number one, you have no visibility into what this customer's total worth is because it's all siloed and it's all bucketed in, in all these different buckets. Uh, at any one time, the customer calls you up and says, hey, it's the 17th of the month. I've got my quarter ending. I need an invoice from you guys. And all of a sudden, someone's got to go in and do the math across all these different orders to make all these charges line up. The customer is receiving six different invoices in the mail from you, and they can't figure it out. So they call the call center, and your poor CSRs, they've got the same problem. They can't figure it out either. Uh, you know, we, we have customers who literally have had this problem where, where their customers were receiving five or six invoices a month from them as they expanded and changed their subscriptions over time. Breakdown number two is, is what we call the, uh, the human billing engine. And this is a situation where, all right, I don't want to deal with six invoices, but my system can't support it, so I'm going to throw bodies at the problem. And these poor people are going to have to take the transactions out of the old system, process all the prorated charges, co-termination amounts, uh, issue credits and refunds, and do it all in a manual way in Excel, and then feed it back into your old, uh, either your old GL or your old ERP system. Of course, that introduces the, the possibility of, of errors into the system. So you end up with inaccurate invoices, missing payments, uh, and, you know, heaven forbid, you end up with uh, reporting inaccurate information to, to the street. And so we've had customers who literally, um, I, I, won't, I won't mention names, but who uh, moved to Zora and ended up with hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of misreported um, transactions because of, of just human error that, that entered the, the, uh, the mix. Um, so we, we've kind of touched on, on why legacy technology can't handle this problem. Um, you know, traditional ERP and GLs have been transaction focused. Some people try to rely on gateways to solve the problem. Gateways are an important part of an overall solution, but at the end of the day, they don't manage subscriptions in an ongoing fashion. And so people turn to trying to build their own solution. And um, Dean, uh, rather than me talk about this, I know this is the boat you guys were in. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what that experience was like for you guys trying to maintain your own billing solution? Yeah, so <clears throat> when we launched our version two, this is about four years ago, uh, we decided that uh, we needed to create our own in-house billing system because there just wasn't anything out there. Um, you know, we've got some very smart developers, and to their credit, they came up with a, I'll call it a, a, a good enough solution. So we you know, handle many thousands of uh, transactions a month, uh, but it was very clear that you know, as our business uh, was growing, as we were adding in uh, other products, as we mentioned about Salesforce, Google Apps, and such, that uh, we wanted to keep our, our uh, dev uh, resources dev resource. focused uh, exclusively on our app because that's our mission. That's what we do best. We want to be best in breed. And it was so a strategic decision on our part was let's go find the best of breed of those people that are focused on uh, automated billing solutions. So that's why we. Uh, chose Zora and you know, haven't been looked back since. <laughs> uh, glad to hear it. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's what we see a lot is, is people, uh, I think, you know, enter into these, the, uh, the thought that, hey, we're just going to build our own solution. And I think underestimate the amount of complexity and the challenges that go with it. And before you know it, it becomes a lifetime investment and you start throwing more and more developers at a solution that's, that is not core to, to you, you know, what your business is all about. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty common. Um, pretty common thing, which is it actually leads into the story of, of how Zawara was founded. So we were founded back in 2007 by some leaders in the uh, subscription economy, the early days subscription economy. So our co-founders, uh, Teen Zwell, was the former CMO and chief strategy officer at Salesforce.com, one of the very first really large subscription-oriented businesses. And he saw firsthand when he, he was trying to manage billing internally in a homegrown system at Salesforce, how complex it got. And so he partnered up with uh, Chung, who's our CTO. Same problem over at WebEx. Again, one of the earliest subscription-based businesses. And the two of them realized there really was no solution on the market to help subscription-oriented businesses manage uh, change over time. And so they, they uh, founded the company. And we've been growing at about 400% year over year. We've got about 130 employees globally across the US, Europe, and China. 
And uh, we, we tend to, to focus on uh, a few sets of customers, a uh, combination of some of the largest subscription companies out there. Uh, so, so big vendors like Dell, like AAA, who manages membership, like Informatica, who's now moving to the cloud and transitioning from a traditional uh, transaction-oriented business and towards more software as a service type offerings, uh, as well as some, some of the fastest growing small companies out there. So companies like Box.net and Marketo and Pandora and, of course, of course ViewPath. And so we see this trend across industries, whether it be high-tech, media and communications, uh, the telco space, and consumer and online services, all moving to the subscription economy. One of the things we focused on from the early days is really building our solution on an infrastructure that could really support uh, true enterprise-grade subscription businesses. So in terms of one massive scale and the ability to support millions of transactions and millions of subscriptions, and you see that with some of our high-volume B2C customers like Ning uh, or our large-volume B2B customers like Box or AAA. Uh, infrastructure and security being incredibly important, particularly around the finance and payment space. So we're fully PCI Level 1 compliant, uh, SAS 70 Type 1 and 2 certified, complete disaster recovery. And one of the things I've been impressed with since I joined Zawara is just the strength of our engineering team to be able to, on our multi-tenant platform, crank out monthly new feature releases. So for the past 26 months, we've done, uh, we've done new feature releases and rolled out new features and functionality. Um, Dean, actually, I know you guys have been a customer for a while. Maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, you know, how that's benefited you guys at, at ViewPath. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're still uh, now adding in more of the services that you're providing for us, uh, which is great. You know, I love the fact that I get emails and saying, as of uh, this week, we've got these new features that are uh, kind of edge case scenarios, but uh, if we don't have an automated solution for it, it sure eats up our support staff. Uh, you know, and what I look at from kind of a strategic point of view that... Uh, affordability and flexibility is is key to our customer re retention, right? So we want to offer pricing options uh, that we say that you know basically any organization can afford. Um, that does introduce complexity. It it uh, more or less demands that we have a very simple self service model that thousands of customers can manage their own account, adding members. Uh, removing members from one month to the next, adding you know upgrades and stuff, uh, and then we only get in there uh, when we absolutely have to when something is escalated because we're dealing with cross department uh, accounts and stuff. So for us, it's it's uh, truly great to have a partner that we feel you know very comfortable we can scale with. Great. Uh, so we've got just about five minutes left, and I want to get to some of the questions that are coming in. So I'll, I'll try to whip through the last few slides here. Um, you know, the other interesting thing about Zawara is our focus has really been pretty broad, and we've set up our infrastructure appropriately to support not only the demands of large enterprise companies like Dell, like Rico, like Thomson Reuters, but uh, offering services that scale all the way down uh, to be usable by, by some of the small and fast-growing companies out there. In fact, Kyle, we have several questions from people like, uh, do you ever support storage as a service, infrastructure as a service, cloud services? I've got multiple questions here where people want to know, do you have any customers like that, and can you support it? We do, and, and that's, that's one of our fastest growing segments. So I would put Box.net into that group. Um, Cloud.com is a customer of ours as well. Cloud service providers and, and um, ISVs like that, they have some of the most complex subscription needs out there in terms of metering usage for processing power, for storage. Uh, and, and, and plans that, that allow people to consume upfront and pay in arrears, and so there's a lot of complexity there. And so that's definitely been a focus of ours, and we have a lot of successful customers who, who are using Zawara to help manage that. Um, the other thing that's unique, I think, about Zawara is that we're really the only platform out there who focused from the beginning on what we call complete subscription commerce. And we touched a little bit on this earlier as to why it's so important that everything across marketing all the way back to finance is in sync. So you've got a subscription-based product catalog. You've got tools to manage subscriptions that flow through the billing and payments back office and the analytics to support that. And I think what we see is a lot of uh, traditional billing vendors kind of jumping in this space, but really focus just on the, the billing and the payments aspect and neglecting some of the other subscription management and product and pricing catalog. And we see all four of those things as being completely core and required to support a subscription business. 
Um, from the first thing being the product catalog. You've got to have a product catalog designed to support subscriptions. And so what that means is you need to contemplate one-time payments, recurring charges, usage charges, uh, and all the different durations and tiers that you might have to go along with it. I think, again, cloud providers being the folks who take advantage of this the most. Um, what's core for us also is that we've ar architected our platform around subscriptions as opposed to orders. Again, the concept of orders being that they are uh, one-time, they represent a one-time sale, they're static, they don't change over time. Uh, taken on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they're isolated, they just represent a subset of your customer's products as opposed to an ongoing subscription that's always changing. It's based around time, it's got this time dimension that you don't find in a transaction-oriented application. Uh, flexible in that you can change and modify them and shrink them and expand them over time and of course holistic in that uh, you know it's, it's it's a complete viewpoint into everything your customer has and then finally the ability ability to feed all of those changes into one subscription billing engine so your initial orders your add-ons your upgrades your downgrades all that feeds into our subscription billing engine and spits out a holistic view of the subscription uh, real-time invoicing at any point in time and of course all the analytics that get wrapped around that. So that's really the, uh, the complete picture of what a true end-to-end -end subscription commerce application set looks like is, you know, a lot of our customers are still relying on something like a salesforce.com on the front end to manage that initial sale and then they're using Zora in the middle to really manage their subscription product catalog, to manage quoting, ordering, and renewals of subscriptions, to of course automate all the billing and rating and payments and then to drill into the analytics around subscriptions, things like monthly recurring revenue and uh, day sales outstanding and delta monthly recurring revenue and total customer value before integrating into the back office to manage your general ledger and your supply chain applications. And so um, with that, I'll just pass it back to Dean. Uh, Dean, maybe one question that I didn't get to ask you uh, as I was going through these last few slides is, you know, what specifically about Zora was it that you looked at when, you know, you realize, hey, we need to get off our own homegrown system. Uh, why, why Zora? Well, uh, there's multiple parts to the answer. Uh, kind of right off the top was the fact that uh, you, know, you guys have gone through all of the pain of uh, PCI compliance. We know that you know your backend systems are rock solid. That's not uh, something that our IT people feel that they didn't have to support. Uh, we really liked your uh, API model so that you know we configure our system to talk to your API layers. Uh, our customers have reported that they really like the ability to preview um, a subscription, a monthly subscription uh, beforehand. So they often want to do hypotheticals. Well, if I add uh, five more people to this month's account, what would be my uh, discount that would apply? So we provide multi uh, user discounts, we provide multi-month discounts, those are compounding discounts. So, you know, we love the fact that Zora has this preview of here's what your bill will look like. And then they click OK. Uh, and then be able to simply go back and review uh, past history, the PDFs of uh, month by month, because often our customers uh, have said, oh, well, I need to have a, a copy of that receipt to hand off to my accounting department because uh, it got overlooked in my inbox so to be able to have them quickly research the past history and again the customer service our customer service people are out of the out of the loop and it turns out to be you know far more cost effective for us and the customers yeah those are those are great examples Dean and, and what I like about all those is, is those are features that we rolled out over the course of um, the last couple of years, and I touched on the fact that Zora does monthly releases. So I think one of the benefits of, of a platform like ours is that the subscription economy is it's still fairly new, and our customers oftentimes are the ones who are being innovative with the things that they are trying to do around subscription. Uh, you know, and their customers are saying, "Hey, I want to. It'd be great if you could price and package this way, or I'd really like to see you know a preview of my bill ahead of time." Those kinds of things. And so yes. because because we have such a, a broad um, perspective on that and so many customers who are using us, we can take that feedback, funnel it into the platform, and then churn that stuff out on, on a monthly basis. So That's I think right. those are great examples. Yeah. And I, I know from our own homegrown uh, accounting system that we would have those ideas <laughs> that we would submit to our dev department and, and you know, they would push back, well, what priorities do you want us to change? You know, so 
exactly. <laughs> you know, to have exactly. to, you know have you guys uh, listen to many more customers and create much more comprehensive solutions is uh, you know, a, a big benefit to us. Great. So, so with that, I think Grover, why don't we turn it over to some of the questions that have been coming in from uh, from the audience? Sure. So one question is, is uh, can you do mixed orders? What if most of our business is subscription? Is there still the equivalent of a one-time order or a one-time invoice? Yeah, a absolutely. We do support that. Uh, we've set up our product catalog to basically there's this kind of three components of, uh, of products in our system. One is one-time charges. So oftentimes you see things like setup fees or just one-time add-ons. You combine that with recurring charges, and those recurring charges can be based around tiers or around different durations, and then also usage-based charges. And so you have the flexibility to mix and match across all of those. In fact, Dean, do you guys have any one-time charges as part of your solution? You know, we're just, just in the process of rolling that out. There you go. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The next question is um, about PCI compliance. You know, is, is, do, are we PCI certified in more than one country, uh, and what level are we? Yeah, great question and something that comes up quite a bit. Uh, we are PCI Level 1 certified, which is uh, you know something that we, we strive for since the early days of, of Zawara, obviously something that's critical to, to our customers and something that can be really expensive to, to try to do on your own. Um, you know, it's, it's cost several hundred thousand dollars to maintain PCI compliance uh, for a business and it just doesn't scale, particularly for, for smaller customers. Okay, and also a question about multiple currencies, of course. You know, do we support more than one currency? Yeah, we do. And, and Dean, you guys are, are selling internationally. Is that true? Yes, we are. And uh, we are now exploring how we would uh, use Zora as our front end for handling those uh, overseas transactions. Yeah. So um, we supported, in fact, our last month's webinar that you can check out on, on our website featured a company, Jimdo, who uh, they price in uh, dozens of different currencies, and we can support yeah. hundreds of different currencies in the system, as well as all the, the unique taxation issues that arise as you start to explore um, yes. different countries and also different regions within different countries, all the way down to mm -hmm. the zip code level. And that's a follow-on question, since Jimdo is a European company, uh, although they're expanding worldwide, uh, are we EU compliant? Are we compliant in the European uh, countries? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question, and again, uh, you know, just as important it is for our, our domestic customers, uh, compliance equally important for our, our European customers, and so um, we've taken those steps as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about discounting? What if uh, what if we want to offer packages that have discounts? Can you talk a little bit about the variations? I know it's a big topic, but uh, yep. got a couple questions on that. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's one of the the key tools that customers will use to try to drive people up that value chain, right? So you start with a Hey, here's the bronze package. Now we've got a, you know, this week only we've got a discount on the platinum package to induce you to, to go ahead and, and upgrade. And so it's definitely something we support. Um, you can support discount charge models uh, and, and all the complexities that go with that in terms of aligning that up to, to back office finances. Um, fully support it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got, I've probably got a dozen questions about specific currencies in here. I think we manage uh, well over 100 currencies right now, and so we'll we'll get back to people individually on your individual currency currency because there are some variations internationally in the taxation sure. that sort of stuff. But uh, but there we we do handle more than 100 currencies, and it is a very active part of the business. Uh, this is not U.S. only kind of thing. Um, next question is: Do we still need a payment gateway? Uh, yes, you, you still do payment gateway. We don't actually process the payments. Uh, the good news is we do integrate to all the, ma the major gateways out there, whether it's Chase or Lila Co. or PayPal. Um, so, so most of our customers choose to, to do that. Can I have more than one payment gateway? Uh, another great question, and the answer there is yes. Also important, uh, particularly important for international customers uh, who, you know, oftentimes different gateways will have uh, very different rates as you're bouncing from country to country. So definitely something that uh, customers have asked for and that we support. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, one more question, and we do have uh, quite a few questions teed up. What we're going to do is we'll get back to you individually. We've got a record of all of your questions here. So the last question is, uh, does this replace my CRM system or my accounting system? So uh, the answer is it, it depends on, on exactly how you use those systems. But do I have to have a CRM so, system? Yeah, so that, another great question. The answer is, is no. You can use this as a standalone application. Um, but the cool thing about Zora, particularly as it relates to CRM, is 
Uh, we have a, an incredibly strong partnership with Salesforce.com, and in fact, we've actually built a native Force.com application that sits right inside of Salesforce that allows you to manage subscription aspects of your business on the front end. So that includes things like a subscription product catalog, that includes things like generating subscription quoting and ordering, and then having all that funnel seamlessly back through Zawara on the back end. So it's really, we call it a dual cloud strategy. We have applications for both front and back office, and so a critical part of it. Uh, we generally uh, don't replace uh, a general ledger. Um, we generally act as a sub-ledger to, to a, a full-on accounting system. Um, and but what we do do is, is handle all the complexities around subscription that a traditional general ledger um, doesn't really support. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, like I said, we do have other questions. One of the biggest questions is: Will there be a recording of this? There will be a recording of this. Uh, we've got a couple of different copies of recording, so we should have a successful video recording. We'll send everybody a link. We believe we're going to get that out this week. So uh, we'll do our best to get you the recording. I'd like to thank our both of our speakers, Dean. Thank you for joining us. Um, You're very welcome. Uh, yeah. yeah, and let, let me just close by again thanking Dean, and I can highly recommend ViewPath if you guys are interested in collaboration and uh, and um, uh, planning software. Uh, fantastic tool. As I said, we use it ourselves to help organize this webinar. If you want to learn more about Zawara, we will get back to you with your individual questions. You can always hop over to our website. We do monthly webinars, so there's a recording history of other ones we've done. You can check out a demo. You can grab a free trial. Uh, so definitely check out uh, zwar.com to learn more. And thank you, everybody, for joining.